happy Sabbath. <laughs> this is part three of that sermon I've been doing. <laughs> the reason why it's taking so many sermons is because this is such a big topic, and we're only scratching the surface of it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's glad. Good to see you. Good to see you. And um, if you've been noticing a lot of the themes that you've been hearing on TV and um, in your lessons, is over revelations, over Daniel, over prophecy, because there are many things happening today. The world wants you to get caught up in watching TV. It wants you to watch movies. It wants you to watch TV sitcoms and sports and it wants you to read these books about fiction, and it wants you to get caught up in the world. So when the important stuff happens, you're not paying that much attention to it. It wants you to watch the news for all the drama that's happening in people's lives. But when the important things happen, the urgency of the time is diminished because it's just one another thing that's happening out there. And, um, this whole sermon began when they passed that law about um, legalized gay marriage. And the first, in part one, we talked about that and about the Christian's role and it's, it's a, a relationship with the government and the laws that it passes. And uh, in part two, we went into um, this, the whole thing, the reason why that law passed was based on this separation of, of the uh, church and state, which actually doesn't exist in the Constitution. And we went over that and how the humanist movement is trying to, um, inf it has infiltrated the government and become the official religion of, of the United States. But in this sermon, we're going back into the Bible. And we're going to look in Revelations 13. And I would like for you to open your Bibles up in Re Revelation 13. There are 18 verses in this, in this chapter. I don't know if we're going to finish it, but I would like to. Um, simply because uh, it covers all the way down to the part where we stand today. And it's pretty obvious if you're paying attention that where we're standing in this, in this chapter. So what I did is because if you've ever studied Daniel Revelation, if you ever studied prophecy, there's a lot of symbols. There's a lot of beasts, horns, crowns. There's a dragon. <laughs> there's seas. There's a, there's a lot of symbols. And a lot of people struggle with that. And so I went on to this website called Amazing Discoveries. It's, it's by Seven Day Adventists. And they actually have the chapter and they have commentary explaining that, that each, each verse. And what I did is I just took that and I'm going to, and if you want to go to that website and, and have something to, to go along with, I chose that to do this sermon so that you would have a resource after the, after the sermon's over to go back and look at it and be able to follow along if you struggle with those with those symbols, because I know I, I, it's easy to get confused of where you, where, who's talking about what. And so, and the last thing I'm going I'm to talk about before we get into it is that I got a video that I put together. It's got three parts to it. The first part is the Pope, and he's speaking to Protestants over here about rejoining, becoming one again. That's the first part. The second part is this last week when he came to the United States and went before Congress, you see him getting more involved with the government in this country. And then the third part is Dr. Carson talking about the Sunday Law. He's talking about um, the New World Order, which we've been talking about. And he's talking about maybe his role, how it plays in that. And this video is to bring to life that we are actually watching prophecy unfold. And so because of time, I'm going to go ahead and get started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the verse. Um, and I want you to read it with me. I'm going to read their commentary, and then I'm going to give my summary of that commentary until we get to the video. And because they do an excellent job of explaining each verse by verse, but it's important that we understand 13, um, and it goes on to 14, 15, 16, 17. The whole book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. But this is where it actually gets into where we are. And so uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Revelation 13, verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. 
All right, and this is the commentary. This beast is similar to the dragon in Revelation 12. They both have seven heads and ten horns. Revelation 17, verse 10, shows us that the seven heads are seven consecutive world powers. Earthly governments Satan used to persecute God's faithful church. The dragon is Satan working through pagan religions, the occult, and spiritualism, while the beast symbolizes Satan working in disguise using the corrupted Christian church to do his work. In verse 5, we see that the beast continues 42 months. That's the 1260-year period of papal dom uh, dominance. That's the medieval, medieval times. In verse 7, it makes war with the saints, persecuting Christ's true followers who struggle to maintain the truth of God's word. This beast is none other than the papal church system. It arose as predicted among the populated nations of Europe, symbolized by the sea and the ten horns in Revelation 17:15. All right, so we're going to read verse 2. Basically, I mean, let me do give my summary. Uh, basically, Daniel and Revelation, they, they, they're based on the same thing. They're, it's just two different um, writers and two different visions. And when you read Revelation, it kind of goes and it, it explains it, and then it explains it again, and then it explains it more. And so you're going to see a lot of cross-references with their commentary. But basically, um, the beast and Revelation and Daniel are, are the same symbols. And most of us here have, that have studied Daniel and Revelation understand that correlation that's happening between the two. But for those who probably don't know it and don't understand it, there is a correlation that when you read about the beast and, and Daniel, that those are actually the same beasts being spoken about in Revelation. All right, in, in verse 2, um, Now the beast which I saw was a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon, which is, symbolizes Satan, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. All right. This beast has the characteristics of a leopard, a bear, and a lion. That, those are the same beast powers mentioned in Daniel, if you remember in Daniel. In Daniel 7, to be more specific. The leopard um, of Greece was uh, the bear the, the leopard was symbolizing Greece. Remember, Greece followed um, the world power after, after Babylon. The bear represented medial Persia, um, and that was the power that followed behind um, Greece. Actually, I don't think that was the order, was it? Well, that wasn't the order. It's reversed, yeah. It was, it was uh, Babylonian, medial Persia, because medial Persia conquered Babylonian. Then it was Greece, and then it was Rome, which was symbolized by the line. No, the line is Babylon. See, did you see how these, how these symbols can confuse you? Like, uh, Rome was the, the first beast and they were talking about in that chapter. Uh, the beast represents the papacy, the same religious political power portrayed by the little horn in, of Daniel 7. So there's Babylon and, and um, Nebuchadnezzar. They're conquered by Medo-Persia, then follows Greece, then follows Rome. Those are the four world powers, and then um, uh, and those are the four beasts that are talked about in, in Daniel Revelation. And then it says, the dragon gives this beast his power and his seats in great authority. And the dragon represents Satan. Pagan Rome gave all these things to, pap uh, to, to pag pagan Rome, gave all these things to papal Rome. And, and apostate Christianity replaced paganism as the means through which Satan persecuted God's faithful church uh, people for hundreds of years. So you have the beast re represents Rome, and you remember that they were a world power. But then what happens, there is no other country that comes in and becomes a new, the new world power. Pa pagan Rome gives its power to papal Rome, which was the Christian church and the pope, the first, the first pope in, um, in those times. And that's the power that actually persecutes throughout the um, 1260 years, which is the medieval times. All right, so let's go to verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it was mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? All right, so... In 1798, the French general Bethier, I guess that's how you pronounce it, Bethier, 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 is that French? 
French birthday, birthday. Okay. Bad with names. <laughs> Under the commands of Napoleon, took the Pope prisoner and attempted to completely eliminate the papacy as an institution. It seems to the world that the papacy was wounded to death because basically he lost his power. His power was stripped, stripped for him, but he was allowed to continue to exist as, you know, in, in their current state. But his power to rule over countries and, and the world basically was taken from him, which, was mean, which means he was wounded but not killed. Um, however, the, the prophecy says that the wound was healed. And in 1929, the papacy regained its civil power with the creation of the Vatican State, and the, world, and the wound began to heal. It wasn't healed, but it began to heal. So um, at some point in the near future, the Roman Catholic Church system will completely cover her former glory and will have more power and prominence than ever before, and the entire world wandered after the beast. Okay, so since 1929... Until this time, the Pope's power has been slowly being restored, but it takes time. He can't, he's not just going to rise back to the top. Now, if you remember, in Daniel, there's this whole back and forth between the king of the north and the king of the south. And the king of the south was represented by atheism. It began with the four generals um, in um, Greece, and then it's, and the, and the, the people who represent the king of the north and south changed through the prophecy, with it finally ending with... Uh, with France and the, um, the French Revolution and atheism coming to become the representation of the King of the South. And then you have the, the papacy, which is the King of the North. And right now, the King of the South is in control. But we're about to read how that actually changes. And we're going to go to verse 5. Where you say the King of the South is It's still atheism. It's still, um, if you notice, this. This world is becoming more and more secular. People just don't believe in God. And if you think about the world history, it was never a question of was there a God. It was who's the God. You get what I'm saying? Everybody believed that there was a true God or there were gods or whatever. But there was never really a question, was there a God? Well, now that's becoming the prevalent um, belief that, that people just don't believe in God, which was what Satan has been trying to do. So that's uh, atheism is the king of the South as now or paganism, or however you want to, it's that whole system that works with that. Uh, uh, let's see here. Five. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And then their commentary just says, the characteristics of this beast pearl are very close to the ones in Daniel 7, 20, 21, and 25, um, and then 8, 10 through 12, because these two books correlate with one another. All right, and, and in verse 8, it says, All who dwell on the earth, who will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the, sl of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Okay. In the last days, nearly the whole world, those whose names are not written in the book of life, with worship, well, with worship this beast. The day is coming soon when the majority of humankind will obey a few supporting, uh, uh, a few supporting the authority of the papacy above the commands of God, and will thus worship the beast. And only those names written in the book of life, in the, written in the Lamb's book of life, will stay true to God. This book um, records the names of all the saved from every generation of Earth's history. Revelations 20, 12, and 15. Okay, we're getting to the part where we're going to have to we're going to break it down a little bit. Verse 10: He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And this is basically the prediction that was filled when the Pope was taken into captivity. And this persecuting power received his deadly wound. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but if you know anything about the medieval, medieval times, about the, um, how, how Christians were persecuted, um, it was kind of ironic that the, the Pope himself was captured and, and done, done the same way. Um, now, we're going to get to the beast from the earth, which is where we start talking about the United States. Let's go to verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, 
and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he, that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and live. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Okay. In that passage, it's where we're at, where, we, where we're witnessing right now. Starting with going back up to 11, um, this is what they say. The next beast in the vision comes up out of the earth and is described as having two horns like a lamb. This beast rest, represents the United States of America. Here are the five clues which help us to accurately determine um, this identity. All right. Clue number one. It comes to power around 1798. As the papacy is going into captivity and receiving its deadly wound, at that time the United States was coming up as a young, a youthful nation. The United States declared its independence on July 4th, 1776, and by 1790, all 13 colonies had ratified the Constitution. This nation was quickly drawn into world politics and today is a world superpower. That's clue number one. Clue number two. The sea represents multitudes and nations. Revelation 17:15, the beasts that arise from the sea usually do so amid the strife of war. Usually countries come into power through war, and that's what traditionally has happened. Um, one country conquers another, now they're in power, and that's the way it's been since the beginning. By contrast, this one comes out of the earth and not the sea representing a relatively peaceful emergence in a comparatively unpopulated area. This is exactly the manner in which the United States came to power. Yes, we did fight the British, but considering uh, usually how countries come to be, it was a very peaceful, um, and it was in the country, in the, uh, everything, the laws, everything was based on Christianity. We, we trusted in God to become the country that we are, and God blessed this country because of it. All right, and then clue number three. This beast with two horns like a lamb represents a nation of youth, innocence, and gentleness. That's the lamb part, which is based on the great two, two great principles of civil and religious liberty. Remember the horns? Horns represent religious and civil power. Uh, for where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, 2 Corinthians 3.17. At its inception, the United States had the strength of its form of government and of its people's religion. Republicanism and Protestantism were the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. It is strong because the government and the church are separate, without one controlling the other. Clue number four. It is noteworthy that this beast lacks any crowns. The United States of America is, grand in, is a grand experiment in government that serves its people rather than enslaving them, and in religion that allows freedom of conscience and expression. It is, a con it is a country that has a government without a king and a religion without a pope. Those crowns was representing the, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I just, this just came to mind. You remember when, um, they, when the Israelites wanted a king? What did the Lord say to them? Basically, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure you don't want me to be the king? Do you want a human king? Because if you take a human king, then you're going to be, there's going to be things demanded of you that you don't, you're, not, you're not used to experiencing. And that's what it, the crown represents. Even in, a, uh, uh, in, the, even in the, the Israelite kingdom, there were things that were happening that wouldn't have happened if God was, was king. And so you have, when, when the crown represents the um, obligations that you owe to whoever is sovereign. And so... This United, the United States didn't have crowns on, on the horns. If you um, know the symbols, the other horns on the beast had crowns around them. All right, and so um, clue number five, it becomes a world power strong enough to force the world on pain of death to worship the image of the beast. This beast will speak as a dragon because remember the dragon is separate from the beast. The dragon gave its power to the beast. 
Dragon represents Satan. This beast will speak as a dragon and exercise all the power of the first beast before him. The first beast, as an agent of the dragon, used its power in state affairs to enforce religious laws, resulting in the persecution of the heretics who would not submit. For America to do this and give life unto the image of the beast, it would have to abandon the principles of religious freedom, repudiate the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and discard the fundamental beliefs that have been made this great, this great nation what it is. When America uses its power to enforce religious, uh, re to enforce religious laws and, and persuades other governments to do the same, it creates an image of the beast, and it gives life, reflecting the intolerance and persecutions of the medieval papal, uh, papal church. Charles, get that video ready. All right, so basically, for those who might be getting confused, there is the dragon, which represents Satan. There was the first beast, which represents papal Rome. And then there's another beast that comes out of the earth, which is representation of the United States. There's two beasts here. Don't, don't get them confused as being one beast. All right? Uh, Charles, let me know when you're ready. Okay, so now we're going to watch that video. I want to stop right there, and I want you to listen or read because the Pope speaks in uh, a different language, Italian or whatever. And he, he actually speaks across the waters to Protestantism over here. And he wants you to listen to what he has to say about rejoining and becoming one. All right. Dear brothers and sisters, excuse me, because I speak in Italian. But I am not uh, speaking English. But uh, I will speak uh, no Italian, no English, but carefully. È una lingua più semplice e più autentica. E questa lingua del cuore ha un linguaggio, è una grammatica speciale, la grammatica semplice, due regole, ama Dio soprattutto e ama l'altro perché è tuo fratello e la tua sorella. E con queste due cose andiamo avanti. Io sono qui con mio fratello, mio vescovo fratello Tony Palmer. Siamo amici da anni. E lui mi ha detto che il vostro compagno, il vostro raduno, e con piacere vi dio un saluto. Un saluto gioioso e nostalgico. Gioioso perché a me dà gioia che, che voi siete riuniti per lodare Gesù Cristo, l'unico Signore, e per e pregare al Padre e ricevere lo Spirito. E questo dà gioia perché si vede che il Signore lavora in tutto il mondo. È nostalgico perché ma succede come nei quartieri fra noi. No? Nei quartieri ci sono famiglie che si vogliono e famiglie che non si vogliono, famiglie che si uniscono e famiglie che si separano. E noi siamo un po', mi permetto la parola, separati. Separati perché i peccati ci hanno separati, i nostri peccati. E I malintesi nella storia, ma una lunga strada di peccato comunitario. Ma chi ha la colpa? Tutti abbiamo la colpa. Tutti siamo peccatori. Eh? Soltanto uno è giusto, il Signore. E io ho la nostalgia che questa separazione finisca e ci dia la comunione, la nostalgia di quell'abbraccio di qua 
nel, nel quale parla la Sacra Scrittura, quando i fratelli di Giuseppe affamati sono andati a Egitto per comprare, per poter mangiare. Ma andavano a comprare, avevano i soldi, ma non potevano mangiare i soldi. E lì hanno trovato qualcosa più del pasto, hanno trovato il fratello. Tutti noi abbiamo dei soldi, i soldi della cultura, i soldi della nostra storia, di tante ricchezze culturali, anche religiose, tra, tradizioni diverse. Ma dobbiamo trovarci come fratelli e dobbiamo piangere insieme, come ha fatto Giuseppe, quel pianto che unisce pianto dell'amore. Io vi parlo come fratello eh? e vi parlo così semplicemente, con gioia e nostalgia, facciamo crescere la nostalgia perché questo ci spingerà a trovarci, a abbracciarci e a lodare Gesù Cristo come unico Signore della storia. Vi ringrazio tanto per sentirmi. Vi ringrazio tanto per lasciarmi parlare la lingua del cuore. E vi chiedo anche un favore di pregare per me perché ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere. Io prego per voi, eh? lo farò, <ride> ma io ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere e pregare al Signore perché ci unisca tutti. E avanti, siamo fratelli, ci diamo spiritualmente questo abbraccio e lasciamo che il Signore finisca l'opera che Lui ha incominciato. Perché questo è un miracolo, il miracolo dell'unità è, è incominciato. E dice uno scrittore italiano, il Manzoni, famoso, dice questa frase in un romanzo, un uomo, un uomo semplice del popolo dice questa frase «Non ho trovato mai che il Signore abbia incominciato un miracolo senza finirlo bene». Lui finirà bene questo miracolo dell'unità. Vi chiedo di benedirmi e io vi benedico. Di fratello a fratello. Un abbraccio. Grazie. The day began with smiles and selfies as the Pope greeted fans who'd waited hours to see him. And then, after a short drive to Capitol Hill, the first official meeting of the day with a clearly nervous House Speaker John Boehner. Your Holiness, welcome. It was Boehner, a Catholic, who'd invited Pope Francis to address the joint session of Congress. It was the first time a Pope had ever received such an invitation. And when he entered the packed chamber, lawmakers gave the pontiff a rousing welcome. But no one was expecting an easy sermon from Pope Francis. His political views on climate change, immigration, abortion and gay marriage are well known. And he wasn't going to spare Washington politicians the benefits of his opinions, starting with immigration. The people of this continent are not fearful of foreigners, because most of us because most of us were once foreigners. And on climate change, the Pope was equally clear. 
I call for a courageous and responsible effort to redirect our steps and to avert the most serious effects of the environmental deterioration caused by human activity. I'm convinced that we can make a difference. I'm sure. Pope Francis also touched on religious extremism, the arms trade, poverty, and called for an end to the death penalty in the U.S., well aware he was addressing a House and Senate more polarized than at any other time in generations. God bless America. Even so, when it was over, whether they agreed or not, the lawmakers did come together with a standing ovation. Because we as Seventh-day Adventists understand the role that the United States is to play, not only now but in the future. And to me it's refreshing to see that your love for your country is causing you not to just say, oh, well, we're all going to, you know, oblivion and, and, and great, where Jesus is about to come. You're actually trying to make your country uh, a better place. Absolutely. And you've been very brave in doing that. Tell, tell me about the United States today and the whole political sure. landscape. Well, recognize that, you know, this is a country that was established for, of, and by the people. It was never supposed to become for, of, and by the government. And people were supposed to be free in every way. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion. All of these things are under enormous attack right now in the United States. They have been for a while. There's an agenda. And you know, people who read a lot know exactly what I'm talking about. If you go back and you look at the writings of Karl Marx, and Vladimir Lenin and uh, you know Saul Alinsky and they talk about how important it is to bring the United States into line with everybody else in order to achieve a new world order but in order to do that they would have to knock down the strongest pillars the Judeo-Christian belief system and the strong family values those are the things that are under attack and that's why I am coming out so strongly against those things. And also the fact that, you know, we have to be willing to stand up for what we believe. Most Americans actually do believe in God. But the media has been so hard on people who proclaim their faith that most people are afraid. And they've been beaten into submission by the political correctness police. And I have declared war on political correctness. And uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people have joined that war. And um, so it's obviously uh, getting quite a bit of traction. And I don't know what role the Lord has for me in all this. I do know, in looking at prophecy, that the United States will play a big role that there has to be a return first to a religious awakening and more than likely any persecution particularly of the sabbath will come from the right not from the left and people will get a little bit overzealous and then they'll say see how much better things are now that we've come back to god and we need to go completely back to him and we need to go you know and they're going to go overboard I hope by that time I'm not around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Carson, we uh, we give you if you ever do become president, you're you're invited back to preach for us. Uh, <laughs> we uh, look. I, I'm looking from afar, and and we're certainly praying. And and I listen to the courage that you have. That's what impresses me about Dr. Carson, because yeah. to have President Obama sitting six feet away and to get up and say the things you said, wasn't, that wasn't a, a soft thing to do. No. It was a brave thing to do. And, and there, was a, there was a penalty for that. You know, I got an IRS audit for the first time. For, first they said, we just want to look at your real estate holdings. But, you know, we're meticulous. We cross every T and dot every I. So they couldn't find anything. They said, well, let's just expand to an entire uh, audit. And they couldn't find anything. Well, let's just do another year. And they 
for three months they kept it up and finally they couldn't find anything so they went away. But, but also, um, one of the organizations uh, I sat on a board for um, that helps the children of prisoners. And they got a million dollar grant every year from the Justice Department. Well, after that, the Justice Department called them up and said, we know who's on your board. We don't have any money for you. And there were several other things um, that I'm not free to talk about, but it's unbelievable. But the, but the thing that keeps me going is Romans chapter 8. It says, if God be for you, who can be against you? You don't need to fear anybody as long as God is there. It's wonderful. I've got so, you're seeing prophecy start to fulfill itself. The Pope cannot take over the world if he doesn't start reaching out and getting people to reach back to him. Already, churches are reaching back to him. It's happening as we speak. And I'm going to continue here because I do want to finish this. In the near future, the United States will speak like a dragon and impose a religious law enforcing the world of the first beast. Protestants in America will reject God's law and his power and, we, and, will, and, God, and his power will be withdrawn from the churches and his protection from the nation. Society will become increasingly evil and violent and at the same time the judgments of God will descend on the United States and the world. Instead of embracing re repentance and inward heart change, Protestant America will demand that the government enforce religious laws to bring this nation back to God. First of all, a, na a law will be enacted making Sunday a day of rest as yeah, and a day of rest as, as for all its citizens. This will be a further rejection of God's law and of his seventh day in the uh, Sabbath in the fourth commandment. As world conditions continue to deteriorate, economic sanctions will be legislated against those who refuse to comply with this new law and they will be unable to buy or sell. Finally, a death decree will be issued against them and the United States will cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Christ returned um, to save his people interrupts the death decree. Okay. The United States will deceive the world into making an image of the first beast through the use of great wonders and miracles. In Revelation 19.20, this beast is called the false prophet. And in Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14, he is said to work these miracles through the spirits of devils. Matthew 14 23 to 23 through 27 indicates that the false Christ will add such strength to those deceptions as to make them very nearly overpowering. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, adds that Satan himself is capable of masquerading as an angel of life. I completely agree with what they're saying here. Uh, if you listen to what Dr. Carson was saying, is that if it, there's going to be persecution, it's not going to come from the left, which is in power now, but it's going to come from the right. Meaning that the persecution of the end times is going to come from a religious awakening that the world is trying to come back to God and they're using that and, God, and, and, the, and Satan's going to use that to go all the way to go um, to persecute God's people that aren't following the, the laws and that are being dictated to, to the world and so there's going to have to be a shift from where we are now to that and, and I've told a few people what I believe is going to happen is, is the we're getting in bad shape and bad condition spiritually now so that we so that uh, the papal p uh, power has the uh, I guess the excuse to come in and save this world from from the wickedness that it's becoming. Because if you know, it's just getting really, really, really bad. <laughs> um, any uh, morals, any dignity, any um, anything that has anything to do with God, it's just completely going to the wayside. People do not believe in God, and those who do believe in God aren't worshiping and following him the way they should be. Christianity, the way we're supposed to be, uh, the way we're supposed to worship God, we're doing a poor job of it as a whole. There are, there are individuals that are doing it the right way, but as a whole, we are asleep as a church, and that is the church of Laodicea. We are falling to the ways of the world, and I completely agree with what they're saying. So I, I believe it's going to get bad, and then it's going to go the other way. But in the process of going the other way, the king of the north wound is completely healed and his power is returned to him. What do you mean it's going to go the other way? Explain what the right, the left 
okay, the left is the liberal point of view, and if you understand what the liberal, it's conservative. The right is conservative. The left is liberal. Conservatism is like um, trying to follow the Bible, trying to um, being very conservative in your viewpoints. Um, I'm not going to get into the political aspect of it, but it's it's more um, right. Right, exactly, following the rules and that sort of thing. The left, which is liberal, is more like, um, like what? Paganism. Paganism. It's more, I am the God in my life. I can do whatever I want. I should be able to do what I want, when I want, how I want, that type of mentality. It doesn't mean anybody that's just a liberal is that. It just means that that's the, that's the kind of viewpoints that the, the left takes. And the right is... Uh, more conservative. That's I mean that's that's the only word I can I know to use. We're on the left right now, and, it, and the world is going farther left right now, but it's got to go back to the right before you start seeing these things happen. In other words, the, if Catholicism and the Pope and and the papal power is going to have control over the world, then it can't be in the. It, there has to have something to happen that causes the world to say, yeah, we'll follow him because. It, if you read the prophecy, not everybody agrees with the laws that they pass, but they follow it anyway because they see the world is in bad shape and they don't want they want things to change. Um, but like I said, I don't know this because th this is just what I believe. And a lot of people believe that this is the way it's going to happen out because we don't really know exactly what is going to transpire. But he gives us clues as to what to watch for. And because of time, I'm not going to finish it anyway. But... If you want to go, I have the website that you can get these commentaries. I think they go through all of Revelation, where they actually just take the verse and they take the com and they come and do commentary over that verse to explain what's happening verse by verse, um, which is very helpful. Not to get confused. Right. It's going to be something that, a calamity that happens that turns the world. Right. If you notice, do you, do you remember what they said in this last shooting in Oregon? Um, they were targeting Christians. Yeah. Have you ever known the media to pick up on that part of the story ever before? Have you, did, you, did you not find that kind of odd? Normally they wouldn't say anything about Christianity. They don't, want, they don't care about Christians. But this particular story, at this particular time, the shooter was targeting Christians. Why do you think that? For, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see who died in it though. But. So I don't know anything about the campus. Is the campus a Christian campus? I don't. I don't know. It was just a just a junior college. So I mean, but why would why would they put that out there? Because they're trying to really they're trying to get everybody riled up. They're trying to create this war, this back and forth, because they do want martial law. Because if they have martial law, they can they can enact the laws and do what they want to do. But if nobody's rioting and going and, and disobeying the laws and causing problems, they're going to have a hard time doing that. So there's a lot of things happening, and you're watching it unfold before you. Didn't you hear something, Gene? Yeah, uh, it was either the assistant governor or the governor of Tennessee advises all Christians to go out and carry guns. Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing that they did. They said, we're going to start carrying arms. Well, I didn't even hear about that. Yeah, that came out the day or two after the Oregon shooting. It's starting. Like, oh, was it somebody else? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody else. So. It's just amazing, though, how the narrative changed to focus specifically on Christianity. Christianity has been on attack for a long time. That's not even been a secret. They've been attacking Christianity for a long time, and they've been censoring Christianity and trying to get it out of culture. Now, all of a sudden, 
the narrative is Christians are under attack. That's to get everybody riled up. But there's a lot more to it, and um, there's no way we can cover it all. But it's good that um, I see now that we start doing this because we're going to do a whole Revelation study, uh, I think, in a month. Is it a month? November. November. So this is, this, is, this is on everybody's mind. It's even on the minds of those who aren't in church. They can feel and recognize that things are happening. That's why when that law passed with the homosexuality law being like uh, the uh, gay marriage, that's why everybody was so passionate about it because you can feel change in the air. You can feel it. And they knew something significant had happened. And that's what this whole sermon was about is to, is to show you how that came to be because at one point in our history, that would never have been allowed. That, that, that would have, if somebody had brought that up, it would have been squashed right there. But this country has moved to a point where they can do that, and you're going to start seeing laws. So if anyone tries to tell you, America, they would never pass a law like that, they're already doing it. And sometimes they don't have to pass a law. They just got to change the interpretation of the law. They changed the public's uh, viewpoint, like the separation of wall, the, the wall of separation between the church and the state. That's not in the Constitution. But they've been telling us for decades that that's saying that's the law, the, the government is free from religion. That's what they've been telling us, that, it should, that religion shouldn't be in it. But in reality, that's not what the founding fathers were saying. Because they, that this whole country and the Constitution was based in Christianity. And it's, it's very interesting if, you, if, if we stop watching the movies and all the stuff they want us to focus on and watch what is important, prophecy is unveiling before your eyes and the urgency of the time is, is great. Right. That's the thing. That, remember about the, the sleeping, the sleeping um, virgins? That's what that's talking about. If we're focused on the world, we are not watching for our Lord and Savior. And it's easy to fall asleep this day and age. If you turn on the TV, you're going to be bombarded with the world. It's just what it is. If you go out in public, you're going to be bombarded with the world. It's just, it, the world is in the church. It's just what it is. So this is the time in our history where we have to dig deep, focus, read our Bibles, pray more than ever before, and return to the Lord the way he told us to be. 100%. AD is not going to get it done. That's where we're at. Get our hearts right. We don't have to know what the, the enemy's doing. That is correct. All we have to focus on is what the Lord told us to focus on, and that's him. So let's pray, and let's get God and the Holy Spirit back in our hearts. All right, so everyone bow your heads. Lord, you are speaking to each and every one of us. Your Holy Spirit is in this place. You're trying to tell us something. And it's time we start listening. We are in the last days. You've told us this. We've known this. But it's time for us to wake up. Help us to be vigilant and to watch for you. Help us to ignore the important, unimportant stuff in this world and to realize that the things that you said was going to happen are happening. They're not going to happen. They are happening now. Lord, we need you more than ever. We need you to help us walk every day. We need to pray, and we need to spend time with you, and we need to become like you. And we just ask that if those are, for those who are struggling, for those who are losing their way, show us who they are. Show us how to reach them and to bring them back to you and how to share this message with you. And, Lord, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to change us so that we can go home. And please come home soon. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.